Welcome to this Introducing Collections event. This is one of our regular events that we host at part, as part of Outside In, um, in which we usually ask a collections manager or an archivist or curator to talk a little bit about their collection um, and introduce how it came about. Um, this event, we'll be hearing from Michael Powell, who is um, at the People's History Museum. The People's History Museum is the National Museum of Democracy, telling the story of its development in Britain. It's the UK's only museum dedicated entirely to sharing the stories of revolutionaries, reformers, workers, voters and citizens who believed then and now in ideas worth fighting for, ideas such as equality, social justice, cooperation and a fair world for all. Michael Powell is the programme lead for Nothing About Us, Without Us, a programme of exhibitions, events, learning activities, exploring the history of disabled people's activism and ongoing fights for rights and inclusion at the People's History Museum. So without further ado, I'd like to kind of introduce Michael and hand over to you for your introduction. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. Um... Um, thank you to the BSL interpreters as well. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Michael Powell. Um, I'll just start by describing myself. I'm currently seated, sitting in my attic room at home, which is also my studio. Um, as well as working at the People's History Museum, I'm an artist as well. So you'll see to the behind me, there's some jars with scissors and pens sticking out and lots of pictures. Um, I'm a white bearded male with balding strawberry blonde hair, uh, which you can't see on Zoom, and I'm wearing an orange jumper. Um, yes, yeah, so as Charlotte introduced me, I am, before I get to a kind of presentation, I'll just kind of talk about the museum and what we do generally, and what I do there. Um, so the People's History Museum is the National Museum of Democracy, and Charlotte kind of explains how we explain ourselves. But the museum has kind of developed um, quite a lot over the last sort of 30, 40 years since its origins, where we actually began in London um, out of a, a need to kind of house the Labour Party's archive, which we still um, have as part of um, a study centre at the museum. Um, the museum moved up to Manchester in the kind of the 80s 90s and um took up residence at a building next near to the mechanics institute where the trade unions meet in manchester and it was that was the first place i ever encountered the museum as a as a child who's wow. been to manchester um and went to visit it in that space um since then we moved we moved to a new site in 2010 uh where we now reside on the edge of Salford and Manchester <clears throat> and we've kind of become much bigger originally we focused our collection was based around the labor party and its archive and also the, a large collection of banners a lot of them trade union based um but the the collections expanded quite a lot in the last 20 years in through actively collecting lots of protest and campaign materials from lots of different groups <laughs> and as such we kind of changed our focus to be we are com we're a campaigning museum but we try to be apolitical as well um and actively collect and work with people on projects to co-produce exhibitions that tell stories often of groups that are the most marginalized in society um and we try to co-produce co in a way where we're working sincerely with people on projects to make them happen and the the, the exhibition i'm going to talk about um in a minute nothing about without us is a good example of that i feel in the length of time it's taken to kind of make it happen my job um 
we don't have a curator at the museum. We kind of have a more democratic model of decision making. I'm program officer is my official title and I'm program lead for nothing about us without us. What that means is I spend a lot of time running around and talking to people um, to kind of help put together exhibitions and events in collaboration with other people, both within our program team and out in partnership across Greater Manchester and beyond on events and exhibitions. Um, so that's just a little bit about me. So my job's kind of part curatorial, part project management, part working with people engagement. So I'm just going to share my screen now and move to my slideshow. Can everybody, can people see that? Um, the first slide is on a red background and it says nothing about us without us and my name Michael Powell in black writing um, so the first slide I wanted to show people today is a section of our disability rights um, is our disability rights section in our main gallery 2 at the museum this is part of our equality section and in this section, it's quite a small area. Um, and it says equality, society isn't equal, though it is much more equal than it was. People have had to fight hard to achieve change, but in society's attitude, both in society's attitudes and government legislation. Um, and there are also kind of some images of flyers and posters relating to disability rights and anti-racism. I'm going to start by saying um openly and transparently that this section is pretty terrible in itself um and this and the reason i'm starting with this is this was the original this was the starting point for the development of our project nothing about us without us um the language isn't very social model some of the flyers and posters are from charities and um, there's also a focus on kind of representing disabled people in a kind of post Second World War focus. Um, and this section still exists as part of our equality section. We haven't changed it yet, um, but we there's good reasons for that. We've con we've had we've consulted on that in twice with lots of groups of people who identify as disabled people and other kind of allies. <laughs> um, and part of the thinking for not changing that at the moment is that we did a similar, we did a project in 2017 called Never Going Underground, which was linked to kind of um, LGBTQIA plus people's rights. Uh, and we actually did make changes to that section through interventions at that time. But the cost of doing so, um, the, the changes we made are now outdated due to the terminology and language changing. And we felt at the moment we we wanted to be open about wanting to change this section of our main galleries through this project, as well as becoming a more welcoming space generally to a disabled people. Um, but we feel that rather than changing just section per section, we need to do a whole main galleries redevelopment and thinking about threading and telling stories that represent lots of different groups of people throughout history rather than kind of putting them in sections um, as the main galleries currently do um, and also to kind of build in a more accessible approach to interpretation which is something we've been trialing and testing over since about 2015 um, and through the nothing about us without us project so that's just kind of a that's the starting point for this project and i kind of wanted to begin there um, so second slide is kind of where this is where nothing about us without us as a project began. We did a small pop up exhibition in our main gallery twos, um, celebrating twenty years um, of the Disability Discrimination Act in two thousand and fifteen. And in this picture, you can see there's a large red banner 
um, with gold writing that says nothing about us without us on it. Um, and this banner was made by lots of um, artists who identified as learning disabled people who worked in collaboration with Venture Arts in Manchester via a postal project to create kind of octagon shaped artworks and send them back across, which was stick together, stitched together for this exhibition. Um, it also has, there's, there's a couple of timelines that link to the, dis, the Disability Discrimination Act. And I think there's some also some images by the um, disabled cartoonist Crippin that I can see framed up there as well. But this was, this was, we're now in 2023, about to go into 2024. Um, 2015 was where we began developing Nothing About Us Without Us as a project. Um, to create this little exhibition, we set up a steering group through kind of contacting disabled people's organisations and um, kind of allies of those organisations and artists and people that we knew uh, that were working across the city primarily. And we, we set up a, a voluntary steering group to kind of help guide this project and to think about how we interpret it. So I'll talk a bit about that process here. So, you know, the, the, that steering group was set up then in 2015, and we kind of consulted with lots of disabled people across Greater Manchester. Pro I'll be quite honest, primarily working in partnership with Greater Manchester Coalition of Disabled People initially, and through them working um, with kind of other people who were part of the coalition but involved in other kind of campaign groups such as disabled well had disabled people against cuts not dead yet uk organizations such as them um and venture arts and pure studio who are organizations that are kind of um represent and work alongside learning disabled artists for, that are based in greater manchester through that that kind of work and that consultation, we created a, and I'm going to flip back and forth here, but in 2018, 19, we created a pop, a kind of bigger pop-up exhibition called Nothing About Us Without Us at the museum in our engine hall space. And there's an image here of the exhibition in the engine hall space. Um, and it's got Hanging up high, you can see a, a large banner that says nothing about us without us in very, very colourful writing that's from Manchester Deepak. And there's a Not Dead Yet UK banner there as well. Um, there's also a Greater Manchester Coalition Disabled People banner, an Autistic Pride banner, and um, Save the Independent Living Fund banner there, as well as kind of T-shirts and images that we kind of, that were pulled together primarily with with and by steering group members and we did that project twice we ran it in 2018 as a month-long exhibition and we kind of deadlines were tight and people couldn't quite bring together the objects they wanted to bring as fully in that first exhibition so six months later we created a second version of it and this image is what you see of that and that ran for a month <clears throat> and that was kind of kind of the second process of consultation on this project and working with people on the project and developing that group so rather than setting it up as a kind of um it was a very organic process and it's kind of developed over time with this the group of people we've been working alongside since then and bringing a lot of other people on with us to make the exhibition happen um i'm going to flip back now now this to my slide that's on a red background that says the process um and i'm going to talk about from from that exhibition um we then and we then got feedback on it and we decided as an organization that we needed to kind of scale this up and devote more kind of focus and programming towards it as an exhibition and also as a program of events because of the kind of the gusto and the feedback that we got from those earlier shows. And I think that's a good example of kind of how we try to work as an organization. Um, like we don't, and we don't get with, we have a kind of big glossy mu or museum 
and kind of were um but we're very much work in a way that is we try to respond to working with people and be flexible to them and try to kind of make sure that the process reflects that as much as possible so it can be quite messy and that's not through kind of like us not being organized because we are very organized but it's true i feel like if you're going to work with people on projects especially durational projects that are long and take time but you need to accept that projects are messy and that you need to respond to things as they happen in order to keep the values and ethos of that project running. Um, so after the, the secondary show, we did another kind of larger, more formal consultation, which is kind of something we generally do for like bigger year long programs of work <laughs> and started with our steering group as the basis for that, thinking about who wasn't represented in that group already. You know, it was to be, and um, I, I was doing it, we were very sort of self acknowledging in that, and that we were very uh, kind of an, an older, primarily white group of people, albeit disabled people, who were meeting. Um, there was no representative from the kind of the deaf or BSL community were on that, on that steering group. Um, and there were no disabled people of colour on that steering group as well. So we decided to actively try to kind of to change that dynamic for the future project. And um, that's, and part, that's part of my role, really, is kind of setting up those conversations and following up on kind of suggestions of organisations and people to talk to through steering group members. Um, that was in 2019 and then COVID arrived and we all know what those years have been and still are like. Um, the The main programme and the main exhibition for Nothing About Us Without was meant to launch in 2021. Um, but we pushed it back a year because of COVID. Um, and unfortunately, it made, it made consulting with particularly like organizations like Manchester Deaf Centre in Manchester and people who attend the Deaf Centre made it much more difficult because I had, you know, no um, prior relationship with people and kind of Zoom calls just aren't, haven't felt as effective for kind of building trust in relationships. Um, but we, we kind of did manage to kind of change the dynamic of that group over that time. Um, <clears throat> And under guidance from our steering group, we did an open call. We, well, we created three and then which became four roles as community curators, which would be paid positions at the museum for um, disabled curators who would work as staff members and researchers on the project. Um, we did an open call, which was quite an informal process um, and our steering group members always outnumbered museum staff in kind of shortlisting for those roles and also interviewing for those roles and I say interviewing in a very light way because we wanted to make it really informal and have a conversation with people whilst trying to structure it and this is a good example of how as an organisation we've tried to change what we've done and adapted it as we've gone along in that for those interviews, we kind of set out, we sent out all questions in advance. You know, we kind of explained who we were on the panel in a bit more depth. Um, and that's something we've taken on board as an organisation and now do for every interview, not just for these roles, because it makes sense when you're interviewing people, you don't want to feel, you don't want to catch people out. You kind of want to give them the best chance of preparing for a conversation, you know? Um and then at, through that process, we kind of appointed four curators who are pictured on the next slide here. Um, we've got from left to right, we've got <clears throat> Anis Akhtar, um, who is from uh, Leeds, formerly Bradford. Um, we've got Hannah Ross, we've got Ruth Malkin, and we've got Alison Wild. Hannah and Ruth are both from Manchester and Alison's from Newcastle. Um, and they were kind of selected by the, the steering group members and myself as curators um, for this project. 
um, and worked as our kind of core research team and were kind of have been vital and instrumental in shaping the exhibition really they're both like some of but i'd say alison is probably from a more academic background ruth is kind of worked on lots of events and is an access consultant um hannah had worked a lot with young people in greater manchester's coalition of disabled people before this anis um had recently become a steering group member um, had had no prior experience working on exhibition projects before, but were really, well, uh, um, were and are really well connected into lots of the disabled people's organisations across the country through the kind of the networking that, that they do. Um, and kind of, we yeah, they were, they worked on the project as staff members at the museum for over a year and a half during the duration of the project. And now continue to work as freelancers now kind of because we're coming to the end of our funding for the project from national Authority heritage fund um and kind of have been instrumental in kind of like developing our events program and have become kind of core steering group members as well so the exhibition itself i've talked a lot about process and i know it's about collections but i kind of want i feel like it's important to do that as well i wanted to kind of give an explanation of kind of where we're coming from as an organization and kind of as where the exhibition started and how it begun. Um, and now I've just skipped to a slide that is um, from within the exhibition of Nothing About Without Us, which ran for a year and finished in October of this year, but is now available as a, it's available as a 3D scan with all accessible formats attached to it. If anyone here hasn't seen it and would like to see it post here which is worth looking at in that way um the first image i'm showing you of the exhibition it's a very busy exhibition there are over 300 objects in the show um that's including images um and i think that is due to kind of the it's a kind of a testament of the kind of the curatorial approach taken by the four curators who worked on the project and the steering group members who worked with them, who would meet with curators monthly and kind of get updates and feed in ideas as things developed. Um, the first image we're seeing here is each, there were six main sections to the exhibition. Um, each of them was um, we tried to use slogans from within the movement to kind of uh, to section them out. This one was called Disabled People Fight Back. And that was the reference to a, a, a banner that had been created at the People's History Museum um, around that kind of the time of that 2015 exhibition we saw earlier um, involving kind of members of um, Great Manchester Coalition Disabled People in that process. And disabled people about fight back was very much about kind of like current and ongoing campaigning that disabled people are doing and have done historically. In this image, like the the first image that jumps out for you is uh, there's a bronze bust of Francis McGinn on the the right hand side of the image, um, and Francis McGinn was so one of our curators, um, Ruth was a um, a BSL user and was very passionate about kind of deaf activism and is a kind of a, a committed uh, deaf campaigner as well. And this section within Disabled People Fight Back called Deaf Liberation Now was very much led by Ruth um, and was kind of her own kind of pet project within, within the show um, and was really much about, and I'll just... Yeah, I've, if if people don't mind, I'll kind of read you the intro panel from that, if that's helpful, that Ruth wrote. And that's the thing to say that for the interpretation for the exhibition, our curators wrote all of the main panel texts and then helped with a lot of the object panel texts, but also anyone who donated stuff to us, uh, we offered the opportunity for them to write their own label as well. So kind of the the voicing sometimes within the labels is different is different depending on whether it's written by the lender or by the curatorial team. 
that makes sense. But the death liberation now section was um, begins with deaf people have been fighting for the right to communicate in sign language since 1880. Delegates of the Second International Congress for the Education of the Deaf voted to ban sign languages for deaf education in favour of speaking, listening and lip reading. 164 delegates were in attendance. Only one was deaf. The repercussions of the ban are still affecting deaf people today. Deaf people immediately started to fight back, forming the National Association of the Deaf and Dumb in 1886. The British Deaf and Dumb Association followed in 1890. Progress was made in 2003 when British Sign Language BSL was formally recognised and in 2022 when the BSL Act was passed. The struggle continues as BSL is not taught in schools and deaf people still fight for access to interpreter, to, to interpreter services. I'm not going to read all panels <laughs> linked to every object, but I thought that was an interesting one to start with because I feel kind of the arc of deaf campaigning and deaf activism and showing the kind of the length of time from kind of the 1880s through to BSL only being formally, formally recognised in 2022 is kind of really kind of um, instructive, like painfully instructive of the kind of the ongoing fight that disabled people face, especially in the kind of the last 20 years and the rollback of austerity. And that's why we felt that disabled people fight back was a really important um, starting point for this exhibition and to reference current campaigning as well. So although this was an exhibition that told the history of the disabled people's movement, it very much highlighted kind of um, ongoing campaigns and the need for kind of changes to legislation that still need to happen. Um, and Francis McGinn, whose bust was here, um, was one of the organisers of the no National Conference of Adult Deaf um, in 1890. And this bust was commissioned by the British Deaf Association um, to celebrate the centenary of the British Deaf Association um, and was loaned from them. <clears throat> In the background to this, you'll see kind of there's there's two, well, there's um, the Nothing About Us Without Us banner that was in the 2017 show by Manchester DPAC and lots of placards that have been used on different DPAC campaigns over time. One of them says Tory cuts kill disabled people. Another one says stop and strap universal credit. And to the left of those, we have um, a quilt, which is known as, as the, um, the Justice for Laughing Boy quilt. And this quilt um, was made in commemoration of Connor Sparrowhawk, um, who was a young man who died whilst being neglected in institutional care. And this this this. Band, this quilt is made up of lots of different patchworks created by individual people and was kind of something that was kind of set up and um, shaped by his his parents as a kind of campaigning tool to kind of highlight the kind of neglect and injustice that Connor faced whilst in the curse system. So there's, you know, there's... Um, that's just a kind of an example of some of the objects in that section. <clears throat> I'll flick to the next image, um, which is kind of moving on from that section. And to the left of that, you see this, <clears throat> you can see the words in green, free our people. <clears throat> and just to note, and I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but each of the sections was colour coded. Um, and that was something that our curators and steering group members came up with when working with the exhibition designers on the project. And that was kind of testament to kind of the the designers worked and did lots of well they did about three or four consultation sessions with curators and steering group members on the design down to kind of selecting the materials on which um, labels would be made. And one of our curators came up with the idea of the color coding to just differentiate sections because um, it's quite a busy show and to kind of nav help navigate the spaces in that way. Um, you'll also, to the left of the Free Our People, there's a QR code with an arrow pointing up to it in green. 
and just to kind of say that this exhibition um was definitely the most i'd say the most accessible exhibition the museum's ever created in that that was kind of one of the driving forces behind it was to kind of when i talked about our main gallery redevelopment before we we want to trial different ways of making interpretation more accessible and us and us as an organization are welcoming space so we can then get it right when we kind of change how our main galleries look as part of a kind of five to ten year old year plan from now to fundraise for that um so every section in the exhibition is bsl interpreted and audio narrated um and is accessible via the qr codes online and you could access access it in person through a, a mobile device which we had for people to use and also for your own if you had them but alongside that, we also made sure we did regular BSL and audio described tours as part of the program that are in person, recognizing that some people prefer not to use digital technology, prefer an in-person experience as well. Hmm. Um, but yeah, Free Our People was our second section, um, which was uh, which essentially is about kind of the origins of the independent living movement in Britain. And this was an interesting section in that when COVID hit and as a, as a steering group, we moved to meeting online rather than meeting monthly, which is what we always did. We actually met every two weeks during the first kind of six months of COVID. And although we delayed the exhibition, we actually developed a film, which was um, called The Short History of Independent Living in the UK. We've led by steering group members who are on that meeting, which was kind of very rough and ready and made for rude Zoom interviews and kind of archive footage working remotely to show that history. But that film, which is available on the museum's YouTube channel, if anyone wants to see it, formed the basis of this section within the exhibition as well and kind of the images that are used within this. So um, you can it's it's hard to see from you know there's an image of Paul Hunt in there who famously kind of wrote a letter to the Guardian um to campaign kind of like for more autonomy and independence for disabled people in decision making who lived in institutional care. There was within this section also there was kind of um the what the um Upias document as well, which is kind of one of the founding um documents of kind of the that led to the origins of the social model of disability you know so this for the free our people section was very much probably the most archive based section within the exhibition um but it then kind of linked round to um the justice for laughing boy quilt and also featured a film by dolly sen called uh, broken hearts for the dwp which is very contemporary in terms of campaigning for ongoing campaigns against um, kind of PIP assessments and welfare support. Um, also featured in this section, the last thing I'll talk about is that there's a label Jars Not People t-shirt, which is a black t-shirt with a white logo on it, which you'll see here that says People First on it. And this is on loan from um, John Lay, who's a member of MetroGAD, uh, the Disabled People's Organisation in London. This was a famous kind of campaign um, for learning disabled people. And I think this T-shirt's from the 90s. Skip to the next one. Just realised, take that off. Um, the third section if in the exhibition that I'm going to talk about is called Tragic But Brave. which is kind of, um, And this section is all about the, the disability arts movement in Britain and how you wouldn't really have a disabled people's movement without a disability arts movement and the kind of the role of the arts in kind of shaping changes and campaigning for changes around kind of representation um, and just kind of the power of the arts in sometimes communicating things in difficult topics in kind of more funny, interesting ways that kind of cut through emotionally with people as well. <clears throat> Um, so there's an array on this main wall here. There's um, 
there's a poster that says Adventures of Super Crip with a disabled cartoon figure, um, superhero figure on it. Um, and this was created through um, conversations with Lawrence Clark, who's um, well, he's a comedian. He's he's actively involved in lots of organisations, but he's kind of the, one of the tra- chairs of Triple C. Whose, whose BAFTA is also on display in this section at the other end, which you can hardly see scrubbed away there, um, which is kind of given to them for the work they've done towards kind of um, kind of raising awareness of kind of different disabled artists and kind of working with different disabled people involved in them and bringing them into the art sector as well. Um, there's also a mu- protest music section in here, um, which features lots of different kind of musicians um, and also video work, which you can't, this image doesn't capture it best, but there's a Catherine Aranello film um, called Pity, which we showed in there as well. Um, I know this, we showed two Catherine Aranello films on the other, on another section, Pity, and this one, it was Meet the Superhumans, which was her, her really funny parody around the Paralympics. Tragic But Brave was colour coded in yellow, like a lemony yellow with black, black writing to contrast with it. Um, and then pulling out of there to our next slide, um, this is kind of the central section of the exhibition, which comprised three different sections together, which then spread out in different ways. So there was, in orange, there's a, a piss on pity section, which was kind of about um, disabled people campaigning against the charity model of disability. Could equally have become we'd call justice not charity um but that was kind of like we wanted to link to kind of the block telephone campaigns for which and we have some of the t-shirts of that that you can't see in this image in this section um in blue there's a section called us which is very much about kind of the the different kind of identities that disabled people have that people may be pan impairment or pan identifying several different ways and was very much about kind of representation um, a, a central image in this section on on a plinth, there is um, a wheelchair user um, wearing protest clothes that say disability pride and piss on pretty. And there's a to boldly go as well, bit in there that you can, I uh, can hardly see. But these were protest clothes that were created by disabled activist uh, Mixed Dennis Queen, who's a steering group member of this project. It's heavily involved in lots of different campaign work. Um, and these are clothes that Dennis made, and the, there's a parasol behind them, which Dennis also makes when they go on different protest marches. Um, and it's a really personal object that Dennis, that we wanted to loan for the exhibition because we kind of, it's um, to not just give a nod to kind of the work that Dennis has done, but we just felt it was really representative of lots of the different kind of like, um, campaigns or events that have happened within the movement through this object and then behind Dennis there is um, a green and purple flag with a sunny star shape in the middle which then has the autistic pride symbol within it and that's uh, an autistic pride flag on loan from us from members of Manchester Autistic Pride and behind that um, you can see another flag, which is a purple flag with a white circle on it, um, which was created by one of our curators, Anis. Um, and Anis identifies as um, a person of intersex, and they felt that the current intersex flag that was being, or symbol that was being used on Intersex Awareness Day was not representative of them. So they created their own version of that, uh, not for the exhibition, but for kind of events prior to this. But then put that in as as part of our section to kind of talk about the different identities that they have and to help campaign for those changes and make people more aware as well. And then behind these objects, right at the back in um, what was our pink section is to boldly go where all of us have gone before, <clears throat> which was a nod to accessible cam- uh, transport campaign work that kind of um, had happened over time, beginning from, you know, um, a lot of the kind of the d- disabled action network materials were in this section, 
there's also um, an artwork called Great Britain from a Wheelchair, which you can see hanging in this section, which was a, a map of Great Britain created by Tony Heaston out of old NHS wheelchairs, which Tony kindly interrupted the, the run of this, this artwork on, its, um, on loan between different venues to put it into our exhibition for six months because he really wanted to be involved as well. Um, and then, just let me skip. Yeah. And then the final image I've got um, before we can move on to questions is kind of taken from the back of where Great Britain from a wheelchair was. So looking at the same section, but in reverse. Um, and to the left, there is a very colorful banner, which was made by Sisters of Frida, a uh, disabled women's collective. Um, which kind of out of kind of a more kind of contemporary banner, the sort of banner that our conservators really don't like, but that everyone loves because it's really colourful and it's made out of lots of modern materials um, that are really hard to conserve, which is why they don't like it. Not that they don't like it visually. Um, but Sister Frida are kind of an active um, campaign group, kind of primarily, I think they're physically based in London and the South, but they're all over the country in terms of membership. Um, and then in our Piss on Pity section, on the right of this image, there's a National League of the Blind um, banner, which is a red banner with National League of the Blind written on it. And that says justice, not charity. And that was kind of, it wasn't a banner that was carried at the National League of the Blind marches, um, but it was kind of of that period. And that was on loan from the Working Class Movement Library. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to say is behind that, because there were lots of video works within this exhibition and you can't see, but there's a video stream right at the end. And that was um, a social model of disability explainer video that had been created by Shape Arts and Endaka. Endaka are the, um, well, I always get the acronym, it's the National Disability Arts Collection and Archive, um, who are one of the partners in um loaning us lots of kind of archive images and a few objects for this exhibition as well. So that's my kind of presentation over. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And um, it's just great to be given a sort of virtual tour of the exhibition and to see so much of it. Um, thank right. you for sharing. Sorry, I know I've overrun slightly. But... No, that's fine. Um, I think we still have a bit of time to go over some questions. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments they'd like to share, then please do um, either pop them in the chat or you can use the raise hand function um, and, and feel free to share a question. Um, I can see um, jo Joanne has put a question in the chat, so maybe we'll just... Yeah. jump into that one if that's okay and um, so they were asking whether um the exhibition ambition is to go national to do national exhibitions um well it's available digitally and by national do you mean like do you mean like touring around the country in different ways because i think that it's been an intention and a desire of student group members to create something like that could do that. But I think due to the, um, the amount of objects and the amount of individual loans in the show, it'd be really difficult to recreate this in other spaces unless they are much bigger. Um, so that's not the intention that we have had approaches and we are having conversations with organizations like the welcome collection in London who came to see it, who were really interested in it as well. Um, I think it just comes down to money, really. So like it's 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 definitely a something our steering group members are really keen on making happen and something we would really be up for doing. But financing it is not something that we could do ourselves. Um so we're hoping, yeah. But I think the the three D strand and going digitally with it helps with that in terms of legacy and kind of showing it to anyone. Uh, and I see that someone's put it. Thank you, Ben, for sharing it on here. 
with people as well in the chat. Um, that's great. I think um kind of had a similar sort of question, sort of slightly building on that. Um, obviously, it sounds like such a challenge to kind of keep all the wording up to date as as language around. Um, I think you mentioned the LGBT section changes and evolves over time. Um, I was wondering how how you managed to balance that with permanent collections and do you see those kind of steering groups? Is that something you'd like to see becoming more commonplace and um, available in other organisations to kind of keep on top of um, making sure that sections are relevant to people now rather than becoming sort of drifting into antiquated language? Yes and yes and no in a way I feel like <clears throat> I feel it's really important to kind of be guided and advised on kind of topics history stories with you know within the nothing about us without us framework by people who kind of are kind of experiencing like life in or kind of linked into those movements rather than kind of cultural venues just kind of writing a history from a curatorial perspective without any consultation or any guidance. Um, but I think it, I think the difficulty is kind of building trust in relationships over time with groups of people that are meaningful as well. Like my, you know, my background, I'll be completely honest. I'm, you know, I've worked in creative production. I'm an artist, but until I started working at the museum, I didn't even know that people studied to work in a museum as a thing. You know, and there's a lot, our organisation is a real mix of people who are kind of from different backgrounds, as well as from kind of from kind of more formal cultural museum backgrounds as well. And I feel that, I feel it's imperative that, you know, people's histories, exhibitions that are created that tell a certain story involve people who, you know, are from the LGBTQ community, or who, you know, have have um different impairments or different experiences or perspectives in that storytelling and it's something we'll continue to do um but not in a kind of like a tokenistic or tacit way i think it's got to kind of like be and our steering group is still meeting now but we're kind of the next the next phase of what we're doing is we kind of we've run an events program alongside all of this where we've kind of put on and built a network of through putting on kind of co-produced events quarterly over the last few years. And we'll continue to meet, carry on with that focus, but also to work out kind of what happens with that group beyond and how it expands. And it would like a really good example is we, as part of this project, we got funding um, for an access audit we did at the very, in the very early stages of consultation work. Um, and part of the funding conditions from National Lottery Heritage Fund for the exhibition was that we had to find about 300k ourselves to make kind of changes to the building. And what part of that included putting, you know, um, incorporating a change in places toilet on our ground level. And it's something we've been, we've successfully managed to do. Um, and it's, the museum's closed in January because that, um, our, our, well, all of our facilities being refreshed on the ground floor level during that time, but also that toilet's being built and incorporated into that into the floor. But what was really great about that was we steering group members who've been involved in this project who are really experienced in working for like Manchester Disabled People's Access Group or worked in the council advising the council kind of on accessible events were involved in helping the design and the redesign of the museum's ground floor level, which is something well beyond the scope of what they signed up for when they got involved with an exhibition project. But I feel because we've kind of, the lines have blurred slightly in a good way, where we've kind of moved beyond like stakeholders into collaborators, like lots of us have become friends through working on this project together, you know, and through getting to know each other over time. And I feel like if you're going to, I feel like a lot of, I think, there needs to be an acceptance that in order to kind of make meaningful changes in bigger organisations, you've got to allow that time for it to happen, you know, and you've got to, and, you know, and access has to become something that's like a core budget line 
in everyone's budget, not something that's like on a project to project basis. Or else mm. it kind of like comes in, comes out, which is. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that resonates a lot with me. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, particularly in terms of just taking the time to kind of build those relationships in person with people over over a long period, I think makes for better exhibitions and deeper connections and means that it's not just as you say tokenistic it's really sort of involving everybody's yeah. different perspectives and also um, except when you get things wrong you know we got lots of things wrong yeah. throughout these whole years but we've always tried to respond openly to that and and make changes rather than be defensive about it because no one gets everything right all the time and the main thing is to try and we just try to you know to be transparent about that as well you know yeah definitely um I can see there's another um question from Joanne about um you being open to 